So it is my honor to now announce Antonio Bicchi, um, whom most of you, especially people working in robotics, will know because of his work in, uh, well, recently again, um, hands and, um, well, many other things. He will talk about impedance in robotics, impedance um, joints, variable impedance joints, and uh, the modeling and the control thereof, rather the identification and the control thereof. Um, Antonio is leading one of the projects I am our DLR is, is joining as well, and um, well, thank you for coming, Antonio. Thank you, thank you very much. Is the mic okay? Is the level good? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for this very nice uh, school, for organizing this. This is, uh, this is great. Uh, I see so many people uh, interested in this, and it's, uh, uh, so this motivated me to go through a little motivation, a little re retrospective before. So uh, the talk today will cover many, uh, many topics. Um, uh, it's a joint with some of my students. I will, uh, I will see, uh, we will see which, which students have done what uh, in, in, in the following. Um, I, as I was saying, I would like to start with a bit of uh, retrospective for this, uh, um, for the work we are uh, now doing. And then uh, I will talk about using variable impedance, optimal control, Tele-impedance, uh, measuring variable impedance, uh, variable stiffness and, and hence, and, and finally the design. I understand this is very ambitious a program. This is a lot of things. This is almost everything I know about this, uh, this, this topic here. And uh, uh, so I might, we might have to vote to, to cut uh, some parts of this project. But let me just start. So. Um, some time ago, we started uh, conferences with uh, these images. So we, you, you might have seen those already. We were explaining why, uh, instead of having a rotor rigidly linked uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the link, uh, you would like to have uh, uh, inertia, I'm sorry, uh, impedance in there. This was back in 2003. Uh, and uh, if you look at the history of variable impedance uh, in, in the terms we are looking at now, it goes basically back to 2001, and now we are 2011. And very few papers at that time. And now in ICRA 2011, we had four sessions on variable stiffness. Uh, we had uh, some, uh, some student counted uh, more than 30 papers on variable stiffness. Um, there is... Uh, uh, the number of papers that are dedicated to variable impedance and stiffness is growing up uh, in recent years very, very steeply. Um, there are many European projects, American projects. Very recently, uh, the physical human robot interaction is, uh, you know, one of the topics, uh, hottest topics in, in uh, National Robotics Initiative, and so on and so forth. So it is really something that uh, is motivating us to go through. As you know, we start, I mean, people started working in variable stiffness actuator, looking at single degrees of freedoms. We did some uh, early prototype in 2001, and then later on in 2003, this one. And then we have now full, uh, almost full homonoids, uh, shoulder to hand, at least, and legs, uh, with uh, variable compliance. Uh, of course, we started with uh, um, the design, and then we started uh, looking into applications. Uh, applications, there are many. Uh, physical human-robot interaction is definitely one of the main. Uh, locomotion, uh, manipulation, haptics, uh, highly dynamic tasks, unstructured environment, and many more that we would like to explore in the future. So, uh, you have seen this already, this is getting very popular, so we will skip this, but this is really motivating why you want to move from motors uh, to muscles for robots. And if you are thinking of muscles for robots, I, I, I think I would like to share this, this uh, sort of view. What uh, will future robots look like? I think, um, I think they will not look like uh, they did uh, some time ago. Uh, what was the poo, the famous Puma that uh, Osama knows uh, uh, very well? You know, we still, we still at night. I think we still have uh, nightmares of Pumas in the in the lab, right? <laughs> uh, they were basically position control devices uh, where you couldn't do any any serious um, uh, control algorithms until you really invented uh, a way around that, uh, ways around that could uh, help you do something more sensible than just pure servo control of the position. Um, 
then you have torque control. And torque control opens up a, a whole new uh, dimension. So people like Osama has been doing torque control before having torque control robots. Uh, and uh, now you do have torque control. I'm depicting this one that has very good uh, torque control capabilities. Of course, the price you pay is that the system is more uh, costly and more, more complex and a little bit more difficult to, 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 uh, to control, maybe. Um, uh, so, what, what, what is next? I believe next is uh, equilibrium point and impedance control, variable stiffness control, where you do not have neither position control nor pure torque control. What you are controlling is the equilibrium of this uh, system and the impedance of this system. And this will make it possible, as we will see in the end, will make it possible to build uh, not so costly devices. Uh, you might basically use uh, simple hardware, you do not need to have extremely high bandwidth as you have here or here, uh, because simply you have robustness in built in the system. Uh, we will see that later on. So uh, I would like to start the, the talk by using uh, the, by describing how to use impeder variable impedance, and many of the topics I will be covering up have uh, strong similarities to what you have heard. Uh, in, in, in previous talks, especially in, in Setu's uh, uh, talk right now. So let me uh, first start with optimal control. I will go through uh, very quickly through safety-oriented uh, optimal control, which is something that goes back uh, eight years now. And then performance-oriented and energy-oriented optimal control, which are the most recent things we are doing. Uh, so this is joint work with Mark, uh, Manolo Garabini, Felipe Bello, Giorgio Grioli, and uh, Mancini, Passaglia, Paolo Solaris, myself. Um, but this is the, the old part of the work. So let me just go through quickly. These are things that uh, you might have uh, seen already. So uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the whole story for us started with thinking about safety. How can we make a safer robot that is still high, well performing? And we started considering that the old uh, uh, approach, the old paradigm of designing robots for accuracy and then controlling them for safety was probably not going to be valid in the future, and we rather would go design for safety and control for accuracy, meaning that we have compliant robots and then we control them to have the accuracy we require. Um, so we started looking into the fact how to compromise, how to use the, uh, how to uh, measure somehow the risk of an impact uh, and uh, how that relates to inertia and velocity. So if you do the uh, risk curve in the inertia and speed uh, plane, you get, depending on the um, metric that you use for safety, you get some limit curve that will tell you basically that the higher the inertia, the lower is the maximum allowable speed. Now, this holds especially in, in regions where this inertia is not big compared with the operator inertia, as Sami explained yesterday uh, very, very well. But once you have reduced the link inertia, and once you have, redu when, once you have uh, uh, used all the compliant covering you can use, then uh, this is the limit on the maximum velocity you can, you, you can have. How can you solve this? Of course, if you have force control or uh, uh, impedance control, active force control. But there is a limit, as we all know very well, there is a limit to what uh, uh, force control can do. In theory, it can uh, have an uh, infinitely fast robot with infinite safety if the, the, the feedback is perfect, but this will not happen. And indeed, what will happen is that you have limited torque link inertia ratio, you have limited mechanical bandwidth between the controller and the contact because of the mechanics itself, and therefore you will have risk, uh, and also you have sampling time limitations, so you will have risks. Um, active force control is indeed ineffective in real conditions. Here are the same data that uh, DLR has shown yesterday in some talk, and you can see from this, from this data that after the uh, impact uh, uh, starts, the, uh, the, the, the signal actually to, to sensors and the deformation of the system arrives once the maximum acceleration peak has already, uh, already been achieved. So it's already too late to somehow 
uh, intervene then. So the idea at that point was, well, let's introduce some compliance here because it makes sense to have compliant robots. They, they, they feel at least safer, right? So what can you do with this? Um, you, you, want, you, you, you might want to have compliance there or you might want to have controllable compliance there, controllable impedance there. So uh, there is a first choice you can do, constant passive compliance. And constant passive compliance can be, uh, can be good because compliance is fixed. You can absorb impact effects, can adapt by changing the elastic element. Uh, you only use one motor and can be actively controlled to alter the apparent impedance. So you have what um, many people now call uh, series elastic as to actuators, SEA. Or you can have variable passive compliance, uh, where you change the compliance by basically using a second motor, a second uh, actuator to change the compliance. Uh, there is, of course, some increased complexity, uh, but there are uh, <clears throat> advantages that we want to uh, discuss today. And these are what we call now variable stiffness actuators. Again, within variable stiffness actuators, you can distinguish between those that can change the uh, stiffness slowly and those that can change it uh, quickly. And this is an important point. In some cases, it's enough that you change the compliance once per task. In some other cases, you want to change the compliance or the impedance during the task, along the task. And in, in the previous talk, we have seen already that changing the compliance during motion can be important. So we will look into this again. Um, so the first optimal control problem, so why, why did we want to do control problems anyway, optimal control problems anyway? Because we think that optimal control is, very, uh, is a very powerful uh, uh, analysis tool. It's not just for the, um, I think optimal control is a very strong tool in our hands because, not just because you get the trajectories or you get the um, you know, profiles because many times you can get insight in what should be done. And this is uh, not depending on the specifics of the problem. Uh, so, for instance, in this case, we are thinking of how to do this uh, optimal, of this, um, sorry, uh, we are thinking of how to do uh, quick as, as quick as possible motions while guaranteeing some level of uh, risk. Risk is, a measure by, is measured by some combination of inertia and compliance. And uh, we want to minimize, we want to look into this problem, minimize the time that it takes for, uh, sorry, for a device to go from A to B um, with some dynamics, subject to limitation on the control input here, and sub subject to some velocity limitations. Velocity limitations are due to safety, basically, right? So if you do this, okay, okay. Uh, if you do this for this case where you have a rigid uh, link here, the, the the problem can be solved analytically. It's very easy indeed. You have the um, uh, you have what we call safe brachistochrone. Brachistochrone is for shortest time, safe because of the safety limit. So it's basically a Pontryagin solution. You go from the initial condition to the boundary of the velocity, then you stay on the, bound, on the maximum allowable velocity for, for safety reasons, and then you go to the desired uh, end position. And this is the best you can do with those limitations. Uh, there is no other possible uh, solution to this. Okay, so what can you do if you insert impedance there? If you insert impedance there, then you can also ch you can look at the problem, and it's a slightly more complex problem because the dynamics now are fourth order dynamics. You still have the state and control constraints, the maximum torque here and the maximum velocity here, and you have initial and final conditions. You do this solution. Now, this solution is already numerical, unfortunately. Uh, only the first problem could be solved analytically. This is already numerical, but you can find a solution. And if you look at uh, the, the optimal solution that you obtain for different stiffnesses, you can tell whether or not there is an optimal stiffness, constant stiffness, that is best. So you basically do many experiments with many different springs, and you see what is the best spring in an SEA. This is basically a series elastic actuator. 
Uh, so a, a series elastic actuator, with whatever control policy you use, and this is the beauty of optimal control because it does, you know, it tells you the best solution. So there is no question about uh, what controller did you use. This is just the best, the optimal controller. The uh, SEA has an optimum here. You can, uh, it's interesting to see what happens at the, at, at the limits. If you have a K, uh, a stiffness in that system that is uh, very, very high, then basically the system here goes back to a rigid system. And therefore, the limit of the cost is exactly the same that you would have uh, with a rigid uh, robot. If you have a very, very low stiffness, then, then basically this would be the coupled. And uh, the minimum time would be very, very high because you have very, very low authority on the moving mass. So the control works on the... The control applies on the first mass and then it has very, very low authority on the second mass if this spring is very, very uh, soft. Right? So neither very high nor very uh, uh, small is, is the best solution for, for a spring. So the best solution is somewhere in the middle and you can find it numerically here. So there is a best SEA for a given task. This is the lesson. Uh, if you change the task, the best, uh, the best spring will change. So the numerical value per se is not so important. Okay. Uh, can you do better by changing the stiffness while you move? This is the, the question. So if you assume that you can change the stiffness while you move, then you have a control problem which is similar to the other one, but now you have another input. You can change this K in time. And assume that you can change it freely, with zero time. Ignore the fact that for changing stiffness you have to put energy in the system. Assume that you have a, a, an input of stiffness directly. Uh, so you do the same safe brachistochrome problem, and what you get is that uh, answers, I mean timing for going from A to B within those limits of velocity, are, uh, are changed. Of course, it depends on how large is the, bound, is the range in which you can change the stiffness. If the range is very, very small, then you are back to the constant spring. And this is the curve that we saw before. The, the alpha equal zero. Alpha is the, is the width of the interval in which you change the stiffness. So if alpha is equal zero, you have the SEA, the series elastic actuator. And you have the old curve. But as soon as you increase the range, you get better and better solutions, as you can see here. And uh, um, so for alpha equal to 0.8, you have already a definite uh, uh, improvement. If uh, this range was infinite, then you would have this absolute optimum here. So changing the stiffness while moving does improve things. Um, what, what was interesting also was to look at what the control would be. And the control looked like this. Uh, velocity would go from zero to maximum allowable velocity uh, along an almost trapezoidal path. And stiffness, stiffness would uh, stay to the maximum value until uh, this time, roughly, and then uh, goes down to minimum stiffness and then up again. So what happens here is that you have maximum stiffness at low velocities when you need to accelerate the link, you need to have power uh, connection between the motor and the link. So uh, maximum acceleration, maximum stiffness, high velocity, very low stiffness. You don't need torque when you are going fast already. And then back again to slow down. So that was the lesson we learned. And uh, the lesson we learned was, uh, uh, you know, we, we had this uh, little slogan, if you want, fast and soft, stiff and slow. And this is uh, probably what remains out of all that work. If you want to move with some uh, safety constraint, you want to be soft when moving fast, and we want to be stiff when uh, moving uh, uh, instead slowly and accelerating. So let's move now to something newer. Um, after we started doing safety, we realized, uh, mainly in the collaboration with DLR and through the work of Sami, that uh, safety was, yes, 
it can be good, but if you use it wrongly, can also be, I mean, VSA can also be bad for safety, and that was uh, shown yesterday. So if I, um, uh, then, then we started thinking, well, but there are more things that you can do with these devices, and of course, uh, people are using variable impedance for many other things, not just for caressing children. So um, we started looking at different things. So this is one interesting, yeah. Uh, one interesting experiment we did a few years ago about hammering. We were hammering nails. One of the good things is uh, with these uh, devices that you can do things like hammering uh, on a rigid, uh, uh, with a rigid uh, support here, sorry, uh, without uh, uh, destroying the motors. And uh, we were doing at different stiffnesses. And if you do it, uh, let me start again. I don't know. Okay, so if you do it uh, with the high stiffness uh, setting of this actuator, then it takes uh, 10 uh, strokes to hit that nail down. But if you use the low compliance, uh, low stiffness, high compliance, then it takes only four, half or less than half uh, strokes. Uh, so, that's good. That makes sense. If you, if you hammer a nail, you don't want to be rigid. If you're rigid, you're only as fast as the motor can be. You want to store energy and then throw it down. So, from, from there, we decided that it would have been interesting to look a little bit more into the details uh, of this. So, we looked at the optimal control problem. So, we take this very simple model again. We have a mass, we have a spring, we have a reference position, we call it theta, and Q is the position of the mass. Uh, we have an index for the optimization problem, which is the velocity at the final time. Uh, we have dynamics, I will get back to the dynamics again. And then we have initial conditions, which, are the, which is the, the hammer position, and we assume that it starts on the nail head. Then we have a terminal constraint which tells that uh, the uh, position at time t has to be again zero. At time t final, you have to be again on, on the nail. Um, if you look at the index, the index is basically just the velocity at the final time. So we want to maximize the velocity of the hammer at the final time. This is the point. But we have this important constraint that the final time you have to be on the nail head. This makes this problem different from what you have seen before from Sami and from Setu, where they were optimizing throw-in. In throw-in, you do not need to be anywhere exactly at the throw-in instant, right? And in this case, you have to be on the nail head. This makes the boundary conditions uh, different. Um, then we also consider one further restriction, which is uh, we only allow one stroke. We might have to do that. Why? Because if, you, for instance, you want to hit, then you only always use one stroke. Or with the hammer, you typically use one stroke. You do not do this, right? Unless in very, in very, very seldom uh, you would do this. So here are the dynamics that we consider. We consider the different dynamics. So we started saying, okay, let's assume that uh, uh, the state is position and velocity of this mass, and we have direct access to the theta position through our control. So assume that our control moves this reference directly. This means that uh, uh, theta can change with limits, but uh, with no dynamics. Uh, so the, the, the whole system dynamics are such uh, are this. Omega is uh, the resonant frequency of, uh, the, the, of the system. It depends on the stiffness, of course. And then uh, we have another model here where instead we access the velocity of the reference and another model where we have access to the acceleration of the reference, of course. So, these are three different models that we are considering to, um, to see what, what, what the dynamics of the model, uh, uh, where do they play. And now, for now, let's consider a constant K. It's a SEA again. So if you do this, 
uh, optimization, you get these results. Now, this, this uh, graph is a little bit dense, so we need to read it uh, in, in detail. First of all, assume that you have position control of the reference, the uh, first case here. Position control shows that the optimal, the link final speed here improves when the stiffness in, uh, increases, omega increasing with the stiffness. Right? So the stiffer, the better. And here are the analytical solutions uh, for this problem. This problem could be solved uh, completely analytical, uh, in an analytical way, no numerical solution here. Um, when you have velocity control, that means we assume that instead of controlling the position, we control the velocity. So we have one integrator. The system becomes three-dimensional. The state is three-dimensional. Then uh, it's, uh, can, it can be checked that the velocity optimum is k invariant. Does not depend on the stiffness. And if the acceleration is controlled in dead, indeed, instead, sorry. Uh, if the acceleration is controlled instead, then the softer is the spring, the better for the final velocity impact. Why is that so? Because if, of course, if you have, I'm sorry, uh, if you have access to the position here, it means, th it means that you can basically change the reference position in zero time to the maximum allowable uh, displacement and then, since you have a K here, you store energy, you're putting energy into the system, um, which is as large as uh, K, basically. I mean, it's linear with K. So you put the maximum energy and then you hit. So the, the larger the K, the better is for the impact. But in, on the other hand, if you have uh, acceleration control, that means that you basically have a dynamics for the input here. Therefore, instead, the, the best case would be that you have a very, very low K so that you can go far away, store a lot of energy in the uh, deformed spring. You have no bounds on the position now. You have only bounds on the acceleration. And there store, therefore, store this large energy. And the, the softer is the spring, the larger is the energy, and then hit. Okay? So, but neither of these cases is very interesting. So what is very interesting is in realistic condition, you have acceleration control, that means torque on a dynamic system, and you have constraints on the position and constraints on the speed. Why? Because the motor has constraints on the speed and the deformation has to be limited. So if you do these things, then you get this solution, which is much more sensible. It's the red case. The red case shows that at varying k, there exists a best k, a best spring, for maximizing the impact. And it is around here. Now, this solution had to be numerical. But this shows that for very, very low stiffness, or for very, very high stiffnesses, the solution is not optimal. There is a best spring for the SEA for hitting the nail. Uh, so apparently the one that we used in the, in, the, in the second example was better than the first one. It was the, the softer was better than the, the stiffer. But if it were too soft, then it would have not been probably as good. These are experimental results. I have no videos, unfortunately. But these are the experimental results that we did to confirm those theoretical um, results. Question. Can variable stiffness actuators further improve the performance? Um, so now you have a state which is q, q dot, and uh, the control is theta and k. Assume again that you can change now the position theta and the reference k. Uh, this is the state space definition, Hamiltonian, co-state dynamics, optimal control law, and luckily, well, luckily, I say luckily, but my student probably doesn't <laughs> think it's uh, complete luck. Uh, they could find uh, a, a very nice analytical solution for this. Now, when, when you can find an analytical solution, you, I think you're blessed because you know, numerical solutions are okay, as we had before. You can get something, but analytical solutions are much more powerful. And this is the solution, this is the theorem that will appear in IRIS 2011. So the optimal control is characterized by uh, properties. The switching sequence is uh, 
let me, uh, let me explain this. Uh, this is the switch of the stiffness, and these are stiff switches of stiffness and reference. So uh, you have a stiffness switch, uh, switch of both stiffness and reference, stiffness, and again, and so forth. So it's a bang-bang control. Stiffness goes from high to low. Reference goes to minimum to maximum position. And the switching frequency of stiffness is double that of the position. There are a few more details here, but let me just uh, get to the point. This is the multi-stroke maximum speed problem. Uh, we have multi-stroke here just to show. You see here, this is the equilibrium position. This is the reference theta that moves from maximum to minimum, maximum to minimum. And stiffness changes twice per period. And you can see here, it changes here. Then they change together. Then stiffness changes. Then they change together again. And this is happening constantly, uh, consistently over many different uh, conditions. So this is part of the lesson. Um, if you do a single stroke case, which was the one that we were interested in, uh, you get these numbers for the switching times. You have that stiffness goes from high to low to high again, and the reference goes from low, from minimum to maximum once. You can solve this. You can solve the, the maximum velocity you can get, and therefore you have that uh, uh, VSA indeed can improve further, and the uh, ratio is, is the following. The maximum velocity you get with VSA is this formula times the maximum velocity you get with uh, the SEA. It's uh, 1 plus k max over k min to the square, the square root of k max over k min divided by 2. So in our experimental setup, it was 30%. Now, you can do whatever you want with SEA is good enough. If you really need to, to maximize uh, performance, then that 30% you can gain with variable stiffness actuation. Um, so I, I, I like this part very much of these results. So there is a second part of the theory. The stiffness optimal control is as follows. Uh, the stiffness is maximum if the product of velocity and acceleration is, is greater than zero. And the stiffness has to be minimum if the product is de less than zero. So this really tells you a story. Um, when the velocity and acceleration have the same sign, that means you are uh, speeding up. Either way, you want to be stiff. If the product is less than zero, that means you are slowing down. Either way, then you want to be soft. So we have a new slogan, which is a stiff speed up and soft slow down. And this is the lessons we take, uh, we take home from this. Right? So this is what you want to do. You want to be stiff when you accelerate and relax completely when you go the other way around. When, when you relax, you relax when you uh, slow down. So the first phase, I don't know if I have this little cartoon. This is the initial time. Then you switch the reference to the maximum value. Then the motor starts going, and you have to be rigid now because you are accelerating. Then at this point, the, the hammer would st start slowing down, right? Because the reference is here. So from here on, the, the hammer would slow down. At that point, you switch stiffness, and you get uh, soft. And then in slowing down, you're soft until you reach the maximum. At this point, again, the velocity changes sign, so you change stiffness. Now you are again stiff until the final time. And this is the optimal solution. And these are the experimental results. We did this, and we verified that it, it does work. That's wonderful. <laughs> uh, this also makes justice of the uh, question, uh, is this, model, uh, is this model really uh, feasible? No, of course, I cannot control this uh, in zero time, but uh, we have done uh, uh, numerical then simulations that show that basically the, com the, the pattern is the same when you have dynamics in the motors. Okay? Uh, and, and, and these experiments, of course, are, are, are there to show that it makes sense, and the switching patterns are very similar. Okay. 
Uh, so, so this is a, this is a conclusion for the optimization with performance oriented. There was another topic that I wanted to cover, but I will not have time, which was uh, optimization of cyclic movements. And again, I'm uh, I'm uh, going along the lines that set has uh, set uh, forward a little time before. Um, there is this paper that is going to appear in uh, September, in, uh, in August actually, IFAC World Congress uh, 2011, uh, where we show that uh, the mechanical compliance that introduces uh, intrinsic passive oscillatory behavior uh, need not be fought all times. You can also exploit it. So um, we use the, the concept of nonlinear resonant modes. Um, you have a, a linear system, you have a resonant mode, and along that resonant mode, the system is very efficient. Now, if you have a nonlinear spring, what is the natural motion? Well, the natural motion can be complex, can be non periodic, can be chaotic, can be whatever. But are there ways of designing this nonlinear spring, maybe varying in time, so that the natural motion is some desirable motion? Okay. Or at least as close as possible to that. And in that paper, we studied this, and we provide a measure of embodiment uh, of how uh, the a desired behavior, let's say you have a path in the spa state space, and, in, and you want to design the spring variations so that the natural path is as close as, as possible to this, meaning that the control action needed to go back on that path are minimized. And the solution is there, but there is no time here. Let me uh, see 36. Yes. I think if you change it, I don't know what the natural resonant frequency is if you change the stiffness. I mean, it's not defined. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, you have a system, you have a nonlinear spring, and you, let, you have uh, ideally no damping, and you set it in motion. If there is an oscillation, you can call that, I, I would call it resonant, nonlinear resonant mode. But that is a very uh, informal, informal uh, definition. So it's the natural motion of a system. Okay only setting the initial conditions and then natural evolution, natural periodic. But of course, need not to be periodic. You, you know very well. Yeah. No, sorry. Okay. So let me now talk about a different topic, which is still impedance. But again, I saw something very similar in Seto's talk. So it's, uh, uh, it's not completely unrelated. So, uh, so the problem is we, we have these uh, devices. Uh, we assume we have these variable impedances. How do we use them? One idea is optimal control. And there are a few things that you can do with optimal control. There are other things that you do, do not do. So you might want to take inspiration from humans or maybe take comment from humans. And this is what this is about. We know that humans change impedance in uh, intelligent ways, in, in suitable ways to, to do tasks. Let me skip this because you have seen this many times already. Um, so, one, one way is uh, let the human do the planning for variable impedance uh, and uh, use it. Of course, this is not the most general thing. It only makes sense in applications where you need to replicate some skills at a distance, but in those cases it might be interesting. So, we are talking about teleoperation of impedance or, uh, or uh, control of uh, impedance in teleoperation. Now, teleoperation normally consists of a slave and a master and the slave and master system are coupled. The uh, position of the master is replicated in the slave, and the forces that are measured in the slave are uh, uh, mirrored on the master. This, at least in the active force controlled uh, master slave system. Now, as you well know, position control alone is not enough because of interaction with unknown remote environments. Therefore, you add force feedback. Force feedback costs a lot and also is a cause for instabilities. Uh, can we instead do remote impedance control? Use the human arm position and impedance as references for robots and avoid completely any cl closing any feedback loop across the teleoperation. Uh, across the teleoperation. 
So uh, use only local controllers, no delays, very stable to make the robot track both position and impedance paths. And let the impedance, physical impedance, take care of uh, the problem. So of course there are three questions. Uh, how do we sense position and impedance? How do we control them on the slave? And is this useful to solve the task? Uh, we use EMGs. Uh, I have the fortune of having a student, uh, Arasha Judani, who did uh, most of this work with us, uh, who is uh, very good at dealing with EMGs, so he brought this into the lab. And uh, um, we are then using EMGs. Let me uh, you know, go quick, very, very quickly, go uh, skip some of these. Uh, there are many uses of uh, EMGs in robotics. One is, uh, uh, these are the, the classical references. There is a very nice work done by uh, Castellini, I don't remember his name, and Patrick in, in DLR, who really inspired our work here, and, uh, and, and so on. Um, of course, uh, surface uh, EMGs are highly correlated with static stiffness as we have seen from Seto's talk and also from famous papers, Ozu and Gomi, for instance. Um, uh, there are rather few applications to robotics, but now they're coming, coming along. Um, so previous work on joint torque and stiffness estimation from EMG signals demonstrated that it is feasible and indicated the methods that we are using here. These are basically work from uh, David Franklin, that we uh, listened to yesterday, uh, Cavato's group, uh, Ozu Gomi, uh, Etienne uh, said to many people that, uh, McIntyre, uh, people that are around this, uh, this very lab. So I don't need to go into the details. We are basically using those ideas uh, to do what we need to do. Um, there is this uh, paper <coughs> by Gomi and Ozu that shows that if F is the signal from the EMGs, you can map this signal through a linear map, at least in local positions of the arm, to the torques that are applied at the uh, endpoint. Um, there is also a result about the fact that uh, th there is another operator, S, which maps the EMGs to the stiffnesses. Um, so, uh, you need to calibrate those matrices. Right? You need to do calibration, you need to take measurements of stiffness at the end point and EMGs and correlate the two. Find this matrix and then you have a local representation of the, part of the uh, relation between EMGs and torques and EMGs and stiffnesses. We have uh, tried to do that, and while it seems that this map is pretty well done, is pretty mm, consistent, uh, this one appears to be uh, a little bit more problematic. So let's see what, what uh, we can do about that. Um, well, first of all, position control. We thought it was not a good idea to do position control with EMGs, because we tried that didn't work. EMGs are related to forces, not to positions. So if you have the hand in this position or in this position relaxed, the same EMG, right? So it's not direct. So what you would have to do is measure the force that you are applying and then integrate uh, in the position of the uh, reference uh, arm, which is not what we want to do. Uh, so instead of doing this, we forget it. Uh, you would have to control the robot force with dynamic scaling and all that, but we simply use very cheap and accurate uh, position sensors uh, in, in the human master hand. 